Hey, it's good to be in the house of God, isn't it? How many of you are expecting God to move and work? Because I believe, I believe that we get according to our expectation. I think if we come with little faith, we tend to receive little. When we come with great faith, we tend to receive great things. And so would you just prepare your hearts? I know you've done this through worship already, but let me just prepare our hearts again. Would you do that? When we come together here at New Life Community Church, we open up the Word. The Word of God is active and alive. It's not just musings about spirituality. It's the living, active, inerrant, inspired Word of God that when it's preached, whether a seasoned preacher or a 10-year-old reading the Word of God, it has the same power It is activated by his word. It penetrates to our spirit and to our mind. It unveils things in our heart. It exposes things in our life. It is powerful, transformative. It is spiritual, supernatural. It is the word of God. And so today we're going to get into the word of God. And we've invited the presence of Jesus into this place. At our last service about eight or nine people gave their life to Christ. And I believe that there's some of you that are here this morning that you don't know exactly why you ended up here today. You you don't know exactly why you took this Sunday morning to be here. Maybe you don't consider yourself very religious. But there's a drawing in your heart. You sensed it. You felt it. Something pulling you towards him. Something you're reminding you that there's something bigger and greater than what you're living right now. You can't describe it. You can't explain it. You can't fully put your finger on it. But you know that God himself is drawing you. You feel something drawing you. Something pushing you towards that which is eternal, that which is supernatural, that which is spiritual, your creator. And I believe that God has brought you here today because he wants to speak to you. And so I want you to keep your mind open and your spirit sensitive and allow the spirit of God, allow the spirit of God to speak to your heart today. So Father, I do pray in Jesus' name. Oh, I invite you, Holy Spirit, into this place. Break down our barriers. Take away our distractions. Tune our spiritual ears to your voice. May we hear you, experience you, and allow you to touch us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we are in a series uh, titled A Different Jesus. And I want to say that sometimes we, well, we have an image of who Jesus is or how he is, and sometimes it doesn't match the Jesus of the Bible. And so I want you to take your Bibles today, whether that is a a smartphone or whether you have a physical Bible with you, and I want you to turn to Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10. For those of you that are newer to your Bible, there's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All four of the Gospels are written uh, firsthand accounts of people that experience Jesus and his life and ministry here on earth. And so they're the story of Jesus, but written from different angles. And so sometimes you'll have uh, three different people tell the same story in a little bit of a different way because they saw it from different angles. This story is actually found in Mark chapter 10, Matthew chapter 20, and Luke chapter 18. The the same story but told from different angles. And today I want to talk to you about what it means to be stuck on the road to change. Stuck on the road to change. Some of you have wanted to change. Some of you at the beginning of this year determined, I am going to change. It's not going to be the same as last year. 
You set your goals. You laid out your New Year's revolu- resolutions, hoping that it would be revolutionary, but only to die down in February. Some of you desperately want to change. Whether it's an addiction you want to let go, whether it's a toxic relationship you want to release from your life, whether it's an attitude that's plagued you since you were 13 years old, whether it's a mindset that you have, whether it's a a, a discomfort with who you are, you said, I want to change, I want to be different, and you go down the road of change but find yourself, well, stuck on the road to change. Just yesterday, I... I experienced a little, uh, a little something in going to a store. I, I had uh, picked up some things at a store the week before. My wife was with me, and she said, hey, you know, you need to exchange it for the right size. How many of you know it's hard to go shopping when you can't try your clothes on? And you're kind of guessing. And so she said, hey, I'm watching the baby for a little bit, so go fast and come back. So I ran. I was focused. I ran. And I w- walked into the store, went downstairs, and one of the, uh, there was a girl there that w- worked for the store, and, and she immediately saw me, made eye contact, and said, hey, sir. And I thought, wow, this is great service. <laughs> Normally, I have to look around, try to find someone. I thought she saw that I had clothes to exchange, and she said, sir. I said, yeah, thank you for coming up to me. She said, sir, where's your mask? And I realized, oh, in my determination, I had forgotten my mask. That happened to anybody else. You walk in somewhere and then like, "Uh uh-oh, thank God I had it in my pocket because it's happened to me before where I had to run all the way to the parking lot, get my mask to run back in. But I was stuck on the road to exchange here. This is being stuck on the road to change. And I want you to listen up because here's the thing. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because you've been stuck in that place. In fact, some of you have come to accept the place that you're stuck in. You've made it part of your existence. You've embraced it as part of your lifestyle. You've determined that it's fate. You've decided that you can't change, that it will always be this way, and you're stuck on the road to change. Mark chapter 10. Begin reading in verse 46, talking about Jesus and his disciples. It says, then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, Jericho was a few miles away from Jerusalem. Jericho is the place where years before, hundreds of years before, the people of Israel had walked around the city seven times, blown the trumpets, and on the seventh day, the walls came tumbling down. It's that Jericho that we're talking about. This Jericho had been rebuilt already, but Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. Earlier on in the chapter, we find out that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, and if you remember what would happen in Jerusalem... They would say, Hosanna, 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 blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then just a few days later, they would be saying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Jesus knew what he was walking into. He was walking towards his death, towards his crucifixion. He felt the weight of in a few days he would be suffering. Nails would pierce his hands, beating would await him. His disciples would forsake him. He would cry on the cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But now, he was just on the journey, on the way to Jerusalem. And the Bible says, there was a large crowd that was with him. Jesus' reputation had preceded him. Some followed Jesus because, well, they heard he was a miracle worker. Some said that he touched the dead and they came to life. Others said that he was not afraid of the lepers, that he would actually touch them and embrace them. Some rumors that he walked on water. 
Others said that he was demonically possessed. Some said that he was going to be the liberator of Israel. Some people followed him because they believed he would be the liberator of the Roman oppression. He would lead the Jewish people in a revolt against the tyranny of the Romans and set them free. Others, well, others thought he was the Messiah. Crowds gathered around, flocked around, the curious the Pharisees, they hated him. The religious people despised them. Some looked for an excuse to kill him. But nonetheless, the crowd gathered around Jesus. Despised, loved, rejected, hated, loved. As he walked out of Jericho, the Bible says there was a blind man. Bar Timaeus was his name, which means son of Timaeus. He was sitting on the roadside begging. That's what disabled people did in the times of Jesus. There was no social security network or system. There was no disability paycheck. If you were a leper and had this disease that ravaged your body, you would beg on the outskirts of the city if you were blind, you had no ability to work and make a living on your own. And so you were destined to live off of the mercy, the tips of people that would walk beside you and have mercy on your plight and maybe throw you a coin or maybe throw you a piece of bread. Your meals depended on the mercy of other people. Such was the plight of Bartimaeus. Now we don't know if he was born blind. We don't know if he became blind later on through an accident or disease. All we know is that Bartimaeus had been blind long enough to be a beggar. It tells us in verse 47, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him, told him to be quiet. But he shouted the more, all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. His name was Bartimaeus which means valuable or highly prized, son of value. Imagine that, that his name, when someone flipped a coin in his mantle in front of him and said, sir, what's your name? He would say, highly prized, highly valued. Yet he was living like a beggar. I'm sure the dissonance of saying to people, yeah, I'm highly valued. My name is highly prized, highly valued, yet he sat in squalor, begging for his existence. I'm sure it felt strange, the irony of being highly valued, but living way beneath human dignity. You ever felt that way? You ever felt like you have a calling, a name, a purpose, a dignity, but yet you look at your circumstances or maybe how you're living and say, I'm living not what I expected. I have a sense of how I should be living, but when I look at how I'm living, when I look at how I am, when I look at my existence, it doesn't match the sense that I have inside of me. He was blind. But it's interesting that the Bible tells us that as Jesus walked in to his sphere, there's a couple of things that we notice about this blind man, Bartimaeus. And by the way, can I just parenthetically say that blindness is a huge uh, problem even in our world today, uh, that 
There's an estimated 253 million people that live with vision impairment. 36 million people around the world are blind today, and 217 million have moderate to severe vision impairment. The Bible tells us that a couple of things that we notice about Bartimaeus is that as soon as Jesus entered into his sphere, there was something that seemed to change about Bartimaeus. He seems to be activated, hear me well, he seems to be activated, listen, he seems to be activated by the presence of Jesus. Here's what I want you to understand. Wherever there is faith, Even though it may be small faith, enter in the presence of Jesus and that faith will be immediately, automatically activated. Because real faith is activated in the presence of Jesus. There's something about blind Bartimaeus when he knows that Jesus is present, when he's in the sphere of Jesus, suddenly he starts acting unusual. Oh, normally he may shout out, but the Bible tells us now he's calling out because he knows Jesus is close. The presence of Jesus is there. His faith is activated and he starts to call out, Jesus, son of David. Now, The name son of David is only given, it's given to the Messiah. Uh, The Bible tells us that the Messiah would be birthed through the lineage of David. We're talking about King David that existed hundreds of years before this time. And the Bible predicts, and you can see the genealogy in the book of Luke, the beginning of Luke, that it traces the genealogy of Jesus all the way down through the lineage of David. In fact, Uh, David was given what is called a Davidic covenant, and he was told, your kingdom will be from everlasting to everlasting, signifying that the Messiah would be born through the genealogy or lineage of David. So when someone said son of David, in essence, they were saying Messiah. So blind Bartimaeus did not look at Jesus as a miracle worker, a religious person, or just a rabbi. Blind Bartimaeus had faith within him that Jesus was the Messiah. And his faith was activated by the presence of Jesus. For Christmas, my kids bought me a doorbell. You say, wow, I got to give your kids some better ideas. No, I I actually like the doorbell they gave me. It's better than a tie with Santa Claus on them or another pair of socks. This was a doorbell, but it's called the ring. And so what happens with the ring is that it is a camera activated doorbell. So when someone walks up to the front of my house and is about to press the doorbell, immediately motion activates the doorbell and I get a ring on my smartphone and it tells me that someone's at my front door and a camera pops up and I can see who's at my front door. I was out of state speaking at a conference and the UPS man came to my door and my my phone rang. He popped up. I saw the UPS man trying to figure out where to put the package. I said, hello, sir. And he went like this. I said, just leave the package right to your right. And he looked like this. He said, okay. I said, don't worry. Just leave it there. It's okay. And I'm telling him from another state where to leave the package. But the thing about this ring is that it's motion activated. When someone is present, the sensors determine that there is presence in that area and it activates, I don't know exactly how it works, but the motion sensors activate something in the technical realm that sends me a signal that puts an image on my screen that gives me the ability to speak, but it's activated only by the presence of people, activated by motion. Something comes alive when someone is close. 
I believe in the very same way, if you have faith, even though it's not a developed faith, even though it may be a baby faith, even though it may be the seed of a faith, that something happens in the presence of Jesus because your faith is activated and suddenly something is awakened inside of you in the presence of Jesus. I've had people tell me, I've had this story over and over and over again. Recently, someone told me, as she was telling her story of first coming to church, she said, I'm not, I, I'm not a, uh, I wasn't a very religious person, but inside I felt like I needed God. And she told me, I came to church for the very first time, and she said, I don't know what happened to me, but she said, as the worship song started singing, she said, I started crying. And I didn't know why I was crying, but I started to weep and cry. And the next Sunday, and she said, I tried to hide it because I felt like it was strange. And she said, I came back the next Sunday, and the same thing happened. As the worship started going, I started crying. And as you started to speak, I started to weep as well. And I didn't know what was going on. I didn't like it. I felt vulnerable. I wasn't sure what was going on. And I said to her, I know exactly what was going on. You were activated in the presence of Jesus because two or three are gathered in Jesus' name. He's there present amongst them. And something happened happens in the presence of Jesus that causes your spirit to awaken inside of you. That which has been dead comes to life. It starts to vocalize its desire for the most high God. It starts to resonate inside of you and it becomes alive even though it's not fully developed. Faith is activated in the presence of Jesus. There are some of you here today that aren't very religious that don't go to church very often. But when you're, when you're in the presence of the Most High God, in the presence of Jesus, in the presence of his word, your faith starts to jitter, it starts to make commotion, your spirit starts to activate, you start to realize there's a part of you that's been dead, that is seeking, that is desiring to come alive. It's the draw of God. It's the spirit of God. The Bible says he draws all men unto himself. And when Jesus is lifted up, he draws people to. And in this place, we acknowledge the supremacy of Jesus. In this place, we're not ashamed to proclaim that he's Messiah, Lord, King of Kings. He's Savior of the world. We lift Jesus up and people are drawn to him or people reject him. But it's clear the supremacy and the deity of Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. Bartimaeus was activated, activated in such a way that he found himself desiring God, wanting God, wanting to be in the presence of Jesus. And his vocal cords started to yell out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. It was unusual for him, out of character, but his faith was activated. And louder he yelled, Jesus! He couldn't see Jesus. He couldn't rise up and jump, so he used what he had, his vocal cords. His eyes couldn't see the figure of Jesus, but he could hear that he was present. He sensed that he was there. And so he yelled, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. People started to get annoyed. Hey, Bart, quiet. We're trying to listen. Don't you? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Bart, please don't embarrass yourself. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, I'm here. Bart, quiet. People start turning around. The crowd tried to hush him. Quiet. You're causing a scene. Listen, when Jesus activates your spirit, when your faith longs for God, you stop caring about what people around you think, what people around you say, what people around you do. You get focused on the presence of the Most High God. Maybe Bart had heard what Jesus quoted in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, quoting the Old Testament, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus declared this about himself. And because he has anointed me, which means empowered me to preach the good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind. Maybe Bart had heard those words. Maybe he knew 
But that was part of the calling of Jesus. It was part of the anointing of Jesus to bring sight to the blind, spiritually and physically. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13 says, You will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And I want you to notice that the more Jesus was around, the greater Bart ramped up his obsession with Jesus, his passion for Jesus, his call for Jesus, and the more people around him tried to quiet him down. Can I tell you, if you're writing notes, write this down, please. On the road to change, do not let people's opinion discourage your pursuit of God. There are some of you right now that have coworkers and friends and maybe family members, maybe even a spouse that say you're getting too fanatical. Man, you're really into this, aren't you? Come on, how many of you have been told that? Bible thumper. Hey, I know you go to church, and that's okay you go to church, but you know, does it have to be an hour and a half, two hours long? Do you have to go to a Bible study too? Do you have to listen to it on the radio? Do you have to put that worship music on? What's up with you? Why are you getting so obsessed, so fanatical, so into it? Why are you getting so, and, and you start thinking, maybe something's wrong with me. Maybe they're right. Maybe I need to pipe it down. Maybe I need to mellow out spiritually a little bit. Maybe I'm taking this too far. But when you're in the presence of Jesus, you find yourself shouting, Jesus, son of David, I want more of you. God, I want to be in your presence. And people think you're an outlier. People think Think that you're a little bit extreme. And I want to tell you this. Do not let people discourage you. Because the Bible says this. That a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. There's something about depth of our persistence. There's something about people that genuinely seek God. That God will not ignore. God can walk past the generic prayers that have no meaning or feeling to them. God can ignore religious mumble and jumble that people do across the nation. But God cannot ignore a heart that is hungry and thirst after him. God will not ignore the cries of people that are desperate for him. He stops, he pauses, he listens, he calls out to those that call upon him with passionate, sincere hearts that have been awakened by his presence. Number two, write this down. On the road to change, you will have to risk and throw away the old as you embrace the new. The Bible says so as Bartimaeus cried, called out, and yelled even more louder. Finally, the disciples took notice, and so did Jesus. And Jesus noticed. We don't know exactly how it came about. We don't know exactly what happened. But we know in verse 49, I love this, that Jesus stopped and he said, call him. Do you wonder what stops Jesus? There was a crowd that day, hundreds, maybe thousands around. But Jesus stopped at Bartimaeus. It reminds me of the Old Testament passage where the prophet tells King Asa, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the earth like they're searching, 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 scanning, 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 and stops when he finds a heart that is fully committed because there he can show and demonstrate his power. You know what that tells me? Listen, it tells me to find a heart that really pursues and seeks after God is rare. 
It tells me that God has to search for something that is not easily found, a heart that's fully committed. Someone, a heart that's fully committed is someone that's all in, someone that says, I will not be dissuaded. This is what I want. This is what I pursue. This is what I need. This is what I'm asking for. This is what I'm searching for. This is what is valuable in my life. To find someone that spiritually is fully committed is rare. And when the Spirit of God scans the earth and goes to and fro throughout all the earth, it stops when it finds a heart that is pursuing him with aggressive, persistent, and full passion. It stops and pays attention. The heart of God stops in be when it finds a heart that is pursuing and fully committed, Jesus stopped in the midst of making his way to Jerusalem. He stopped his journey to Jerusalem. He stopped. He said, hey, hold it. I hear that man. I hear the cry. And I'm sure that something awoken in Jesus' spirit as he as he responded to the desperate cry of a man that was calling out from the bottom of his heart to Jesus. The Bible says that, it tells us in verse 49, Jesus stopped and said, call him. You know, I love the contrast. People around him are saying, be quiet. You're embarrassing us. Pipe it down. And Jesus says, bring him. Some people are say, push him away. Jesus says, bring him closer. Next time you see someone weeping at the altar in brokenness before Jesus, Before you scratch him out as a fanatic, maybe that's the very person that's getting the heart and attention of God. It's not always the lofty, eloquent prayers. It's not the well-crafted vocabulary. It's not the poetic sounding oratory as someone reaches out to God, sometimes it's the weeping of a sobbing heart that just says, I need you, Jesus. The Bible tells us that Jesus stopped and he said, call him. So they called the blind man. Cheer up. Sounds British. Cheer up. On your feet. He's calling Verse 50, throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and he came to Jesus. I want to pause for a second there because I think that we can just read over this and not really understand what is happening here. Jesus has just called them. The disciples go to them. The crowd is quieted down and someone touches Bart and says, hey, Bart, settle down. Settle, listen, listen. The Messiah is calling you. Here's the response of Bart. Bart jumps off. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Every word in scripture is inspired, is there for a purpose. There's a meaning to it. We need to understand it. Don't just dismiss some of the details that scripture give us, gives us as, as just though it's secondary. The Bible says, listen, you may miss this. You may have read this real quick and not noticed it, but the Bible says very clearly, it says that uh, cheer up, he's calling you on your feet. Verse 50, he says, throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and he came to Jesus. I want to, I want to pause on that, on that phrase, throwing his cloak aside. Every Jewish man in those days had a cloak. It was the outer garment. It wasn't to keep warm because in those days, obviously, this is taking place in the Middle East, and typically it's pretty warm, but it was the outer garment, it was the cloak that, that most people had. But for a beggar, the cloak on the outside served a dual purpose. They would wear the cloak, but they would also use the cloak as the place where people would throw 
their chains or their food. It was dirty. It was the cloak of a beggar. It symbolized the life that he had embraced, the life that was his. It was the cloak of a beggar. It was his tools. It symbolized his lifestyle. And I want you to notice that when he went to Jesus, he deliberately threw his cloak aside. Now, you may run past that without giving it much attention, but when you're a beggar, every single item that you have is important because you own very little. When you're a beggar, to throw your cloak aside has a bigger significance, and I believe that was happening with blind Bartimaeus is that he was stepping towards Jesus, and as he was stepping towards Jesus, he was declaring, I'm leaving this life behind. I will never go back to it. I will never see it. I don't need it. I'm not going to turn back. I'm not leaving a safety net. He didn't say, hold on. Let me tuck it under my arm and go for him in case in case I have to go back to begging. No, he leaves it behind. There's a risk he's taking. He's stepping towards Jesus in faith. I'm not going back to it. I'm not grabbing it. it this life is over. I have been stuck, but I will never go back to who I was. You know, the cloak or the mantle is important. Elijah took his cloak and he gave it to Elijah, his apprentice. And that represented his calling. And he struck the water, if you remember, and a miracle happened. His cloak symbolized lifestyle, calling, who you are. And he throws it aside. He throws it aside... Because he's taking a risk to believe that an encounter with Jesus will change his destiny and alter who he is. I believe that so many times we take a step towards Jesus, but we keep our cloak with us. It's not a full commitment. It's not a, I'm taking a risk totally, is I'm keeping my safety net. And so many people are never able to experience what God has for them because they're not fully ready to surrender what they should be walking away from. I've used this illustration before, but it's a great illustration. I heard that there is a tribe in Africa that hunts the delicacy of monkeys. And monkeys in certain parts in certain parts of the world are eaten. And there's certain tribal groups that hunt monkeys this way. They'll take a coconut and they'll carve a little hole in that coconut, just big enough for this kind of monkey to put his hand in there. And then they'll put some nuts and some fruit inside of that coconut. And then they'll tie that coconut to a tree so that, it's, so that it's anchored to that tree. And then they'll just get and wait and they'll hide. And they'll watch how the monkeys will come around and start sniffing and looking. And then finally a monkey will see that within the coconut there's some nuts and some uh, fruit. And so they'll put their hand in the coconut and they'll grab a fistful of nuts. But once they clench their fist, they can't get their hand out. And the monkey will jump around and squeal and, and scream like monkeys do, but they, they are unwilling to let go. And so while they don't let go, they're trapped because the fist won't go out of the hole and the, and the hunters quickly run out and they're able to trap the monkey. The monkey feels like it's trapped, but it's not really trapped. It's trapped by its own unwillingness to let go. Hear me well, hear me well. Listen, there are some people here that you've heard about Jesus and you've heard the gospel and you've heard about what it means to follow him and you're attracted to it, drawn to it. It seems appealing to you. You've wanted to do it, but you say, it just don't seem like I can. I feel like I'm stuck, but really you're stuck because you have a fist on that which you want to keep. And God is saying, if you're going to chase after me, let go. Open up your fist. Stop clinging on. 
For some of you, it may be a boyfriend or girlfriend that you're living with. Someone else, it may be an addiction that you've hang on to for a long time. It may be something in your life that you're unwilling to let go of. And God is saying, hey, come to me the way you are. But if you come to me, you have to surrender and let me be the Lord and Savior of your life. And you stay stuck. Not because you can't be fret, set free, but you say you stay stuck because you're unwilling to release and trust God. Bartimaeus, threw his cloak aside and went to the presence of Jesus. Number three. On the way to change, you will need to be bold in your faith and clear in the steps that follow. Verse 51, Bartimaeus is finally in front of Jesus. He can't see him, but he can hear him. The crowd is pressing in. The disciples have brought Blind Bartimaeus in front of Jesus. He's dirty. He lacks his cloak. He's blind. The crowd is around. Bartimaeus isn't screaming anymore. But I imagine his voice was hoarse from the screaming that he had made. And Jesus addresses Bartimaeus. And he says this. A very strange question. What do you want me to do for you? Hello? <laughs> Feels obvious. There's something about the passion of our heart, the desire of our soul being articulated verbally through our words. When a child is small, they cry, and, ah, and, and you, you try to calm them down, and you say, now what do you want? And they may be pointing to a toy or whatever they want, they're crying about, but, but you want them to articulate. Now tell me, what do you want? There's something powerful about articulating the longing of our soul, the the desires of our heart. There's something about that that Jesus, Jesus often says. There's something about when someone comes to follow him that God doesn't just say, hey, I want you to believe and surrender in your heart. There's something about articulating that. And in fact, the Bible says that if you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth. I don't want it just to be inside of your soul. I don't want it to be a, a vague emotion. I want you to speak it with your mouth. What is it that you want? Even in confessing Jesus, even as you choose to follow Jesus, it's not just about it being in your heart. It's about you articulated it with your voice as well. You have to believe it enough to say it, to speak it. Hey, when I marry people, I don't just say to them, hey, if this is in your heart, if you really want it, nod at me or grunt. No, 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 no. I say, say I do. I want to hear you say it with your mouth. I want you to repeat these vows of commitment. I want the longing of your heart to be expressed verbally. I don't want there to be any confusion. And if I marry you and you say, I do, I'll say, could you say it louder and again? I want, I do. I'm expecting this to last a lifetime, so it better be hearty. <laughs> Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Now, if you notice in this passage, a few verses earlier in the same chapter, chapter 10, verse 35, Jesus is speaking to his disciples and two disciples, James and John, who were brothers, sons of Zebedee or sons of thunder, come to speak to Jesus and they come to Jesus and they say, hey, Jesus, we want something from you. And he says to them in verse 36, the same question, what do you want me to do for you? And they said, hey, we want to reign with you, me at the right side, him at the left side. We want power and position when you come into your kingdom. And he says, you don't know what you're asking. 
Twice in one chapter, Jesus asks the same question, what do you want me to do for you? And in one, he tells them, I'm not going to give it to you because it was selfish. It was about their ambition. It was about their position. It was about their selfishness. But, it, but when it came to Bartimaeus, he says, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus is clear. He says, Rabbi, the, the, the expression is that in the Greek is more than just teacher. Rabbi tends to mean teacher, but he uses an expression that is greater than teacher. It means master or Lord. So he says to Jesus, master, I want to see. And Jesus says, go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately. Say immediate. immediately. You know, sometimes God works progressively, but other times God works immediately. Sometimes it's a long journey. And by the way, I'm sure Bartimaeus felt like this was a long journey, but sometimes things can change immediately. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Here's what I want you to understand. Bartimaeus had faith. What kind of faith? A faith that was persistent. He cried out more. A faith that acknowledged who Jesus was. He believed that he was a Messiah. A faith that was humble. It came to him and said, have mercy. A faith that was submitted to his master. Rabboni, he called him. A faith that was specific about his request. I want to see. The Bible tells us, and without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 says, and if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart that one believes and is justified. It is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand with me. I'm going to close this service. I'm reminded of the old hymn sung in churches all across the nation that says, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While in others thou art calling, do not pass me by. As I close this service, I want to say this. Some of you have been activated by the presence of Jesus in this place. You know that the Spirit of God has spoken to you. It's more than a speech or a lecture it's the spirit of the living God drawing you to him. You sense it. You know it. He's been calling you before you walked in this place because that's the way God works. He's been putting people in your life. He's been putting signs in you. He's been stirring a discontentment in your soul. Why am I still on the road to change? And when Jesus comes into this place, there's something that's awakened inside. You can't articulate it. You can't describe it. But you know you need it. And you know it's in Jesus. I'm going to ask you to stand right now. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I feel like I'm Bartimaeus. I've never given my life to Christ. I've never come to Jesus verbally, physically. I've been around the things of God, but I've never said with my mouth, I choose to follow him. I want him. I've never believed, repented, been baptized. I've never come. But, but I feel like God has been calling me for a while. I sense it. My faith is activated. I want it. I know that God is calling me. And I want, I want Jesus here. 
I don't, I don't care if people see me. I don't care what people think about me. I want to shout out, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, come, I, I need you. I, I'm not embarrassed. I don't care. I'm like Bartimaeus. My faith is activated. I'm here this morning. I want Jesus. If you've never given your life to Christ and you say, Pastor, I want to be a follower. I need Jesus. I, I want him in my life. I want him to cleanse me, change me, forgive me, save me, alter my life. I know it. I can't explain it. I'm not a theologian, but I know I need Jesus. I want you just to raise your hand and say, I, I, yeah, I, I, today I want Jesus. I, I know I need to. Okay. All right. I know I need Jesus. I know I need Jesus. I know I want him. I know I need to make a decision. I, I know he, I, I want him. Okay. Okay, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Then I'm going to ask as, the, um, as our musicians sing, I'm going to say, if you, if you know you need God today, if your faith has been activated and you're wanting to pursue him, then I'm going to ask that you get out of your seat if you raise your hand and you just come and I want to pray with you right here. So, but, but you know, you, you have to want them enough not to care what people think, by the way. I know it's a big deal to get out of your chair in front of a big audience like this, but I don't care. I feel like if you want Jesus hard enough, then it doesn't matter where people are at. You ready to follow Jesus? Okay. All right. All right. Who else? Who else is saying? Yeah. Hey, God bless you. Who else? Who else is saying today I need to follow Jesus? I don't care. People are going to try to shut me down. Be quiet. Don't hear. But I'm, I'm ready to follow Jesus. Today is my day. I'm giving my life to Jesus. I don't want to wait anymore. I don't want to push it back. I want to follow Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. I'm giving you a, a moment in time. I know that God has been calling me. I want to follow Jesus. I want to chase after him. I don't care if people think I'm a radical or a fanatic. I don't care if people think that I'm crazy. It's, it's about time that I encounter Jesus. Can I tell you, we've been praying for you. We've been praying for you. We've been praying. People have been praying that you would hear his voice. People have been praying that you would respond to him. The Spirit of God has been drawing, telling you that he loves you. You've known you've heard the voice of God in your heart. You feel the call of God. It's the Spirit of the living God calling you unto, unto himself, drawing you to him, awakening something inside of you that only God can awaken. I'm going to pray for you, but I, here's what I want to make clear. There is no magic prayer that saves you. Don't ever come and say, well, Pastor Mark prayed for me. That's why I'm saved. No, I don't save anybody. I can't save anybody. I need a savior myself, Jesus. But I can lead you in a prayer if it's your heart's cry. And the Bible's clear about this, that you have to believe that Jesus, yeah, Jesus was all God, became all man, died on a cross to pay a price that you couldn't pay. There's no good works that you could do to make it to God. You can't be good enough for God. Someone has to pay the price of your sin. And my sin, Jesus came to do what you and I couldn't do for ourselves. And he gives us a gift, but he says, if you receive the gift, the Bible is clear. He offers that gift, but we have to repent. Repent means I have to turn away. It's that monkey letting go. Listen. There's nothing that you have to clean up to come to Jesus, but if you come to Jesus and you're real, you have to repent of your sin. You can't be perfect for God, but you have to be willing to say, whatever I know, I turn away from to follow Jesus. And here's what happens. You ask him to be your Lord and Savior. You repent of your sin and you surrender the, Lord, the, the rule of your life to God and you say, come inside of me, King of kings and Lord of lords. Holy Spirit, change me from the inside out. The Bible calls that being born again. You could try for the rest of your life to be right with God, but you can never be good enough for him. Jesus is the one who changes you. He's the one who heals you, restores you, He's the one who makes you right before God. I did it when I was 15. I bowed my knee and I said, Lord, I, I can't save myself. I'm tired. And, and, and the moment that we do that, the Holy Spirit comes inside of it and changes us from the inside out. So if that's what you want to do, if that's what you want to do, then I'm going to ask that you do this. If, if, if you can, would you bow your knee? 
it's symbolic. It's symbolic of I'm surrendering to you. I feel like God has been calling out to some of you for a long time. I feel like the Spirit of God, is, His heart is rejoicing. I feel like God is saying to some of you, daughter, you finally responded. I've been calling you. I've been reaching out. I've been, I've been pursuing you. You're finally here. You're finally here. If this is what you desire to do with your knees bowed and your hands raised to God, would you just pray this prayer? If you mean it, I want you to pray it out loud. I want you to say, dear God, go ahead out loud, dear God, I know I've sinned against you. I can't save myself. I can't cleanse myself. I come to Jesus, asking him to be my Lord and my Savior. I choose to follow you, Jesus. I turn away from the way that I've been living. I choose your way. Come, Holy Spirit, and make me a new person. Today is the beginning of my new life. To stay in that posture. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Spirit of the living God, I pray even now that wash, wash away, Father. Yes, Lord, wash it away. Come, Holy Spirit. Yeah, you can be new. Come, Holy Spirit, change and power. Hear the words, daughter, daughter spoken over you not servant not slave but daughter daughter come Holy Spirit thank you for washing the stains that my sister never thought could be washed God thank you for washing that which she thought she would live with for the rest of her life thank you that there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus that you've taken her condemnation away God and you've spoken love over her and life over her. Thank you, Spirit of the living God, for you are working. Thank you, Lord, that you are taking shame away. No, no, shame away. There is no shame before the Father. Your face is radiant before the Father. He has washed you, cleansed you, given you a new name. You have been made a child of the Most High God. Come, Spirit of the living God. Come, sense the power of God. Know his love for you in a powerful, deep, supernatural way. Come, Spirit of the living God. Yes, not your works. You can never be good enough. He's given you the gift. Now receive it. Receive that gift. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. If any person be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. They've been made new by the power of the blood of Jesus. We lift up Jesus as the creator. If you are in Jesus Christ, you are a new creation. There's nothing that you could do to earn it or deserve it. We want to help you grow in Christ. We want to help you mature in Christ. We want to mentor you and help you out. There's going to be people around you that you can talk to and pray with you. But as these people are, how many of you know that God is good? We're going to close with a song. If you need to pray at this altar, you're already a believer, but you say, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck on the road to change and I need to get on my face before God and say, here I am. This altar's open. We're going to close with a song and we'll dismiss when we're done with this final song. Let's sing. Thank you, Lord Jesus.